How's everybody's almost last week of the semester going? Not as well as you'd hope. Hi. So what's being eaten back there? My favorite food of choice for all occasions is Fruit Loops. Oh, yeah. And we're having stewed monkey brains and uh, pig liver. Oh, that's okay, too. I think the oddest thing I've ever eaten is uh, dumplings that I was told were made from snakes. It didn't. I think they just said that to scare the Westerner because it tasted just fine. But chitlins were, those were pretty bad. The more you chew them, the bigger they get. And it just, it's more than I think, I don't know, you have to be in the right mental state <laughs> to enjoy them. That's for sure. Well, uh, guys, who would, who wants to do a presentation today? Either the uh, PowerPoint or the uh, artistic critique. Um, this week, at least three people volunteered. I'm just wondering who is going to be able to do that today. I want to do an artistic critique today. All right, great. Anybody else? All right, do you, uh, Alyssa, do you want to do your own stuff or somebody else's or both? Um, somebody else's. Okay. Did you already send me the image? Um, not yet. Can I do that right now? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Are you just sending it through a uh, regular inbox? Yeah. Okay. Uh, is anybody else going to want to be doing their critiques today? Because if not, Alyssa will be all alone. All right, first, let's do roll. Alyssa, are you here? Yep. Uh, Delane? James? Is Sage here? Yes, uh, James is here. Oh, James. Okay, here we go. How about Sage? Hazel? I'm here. All right. Okay, let's see. I'm sorry, my computer's giving me a little bit of a hard time trying to download this thing. All right, looks like it, it's coming through. Okay, I'm going to do a screen share so you guys can see what the image is. Alyssa, are you good to go now? Yeah. All right. Okay, can everybody see this image? Yeah. Okay, how about this one? Yep. All right, great. Uh, which one would you like me to keep it on? Alyssa? Um, do the other one. 
All right. The floor is yours. OK, so this piece appears to be um, wooden skewers cut up into smaller segments glued together in order to make different shapes like squares, um, rectangles and triangles. And the skin texture that seems to cover it might be wax paper or something very thin, white, almost transparent. Um, this is an abstract work. And I think the first thing I notice when I look at the piece is how it almost seems like it's protruding out of the surface as if part of it is stuck to the surface and then the rest is trying to escape out of it. And it seems like they probably had to you know, have a lot of patience in order to get these glued in this very um, specific way in order to get them to stand up with without any supports. Um, that would have taken time. Maybe they set it up on a support while it glued to wait for that. Um, I think that the, you know, the choice of material was probably very particular, wanting you to be able to see through each piece and um, experience both the structure and the skin elements. Um, I think that this piece kind of looks like um, a lots of mirrors set up against each other. I kind of think of a hall of mirrors that you might see at a circus. And I think the artist might be trying to make commentary about um, as a society, our obsession with the self and concern with how we always look and how um, everywhere we turn, we are trying to portray ourselves a certain way um, as if, you know, we're looking in the mirror and trying to be the best version of ourselves or whatever we want to look like. And so I think that it was made to kind of send a message on that and show, you know, they kind of look like broken mirrors and show that that's a kind of broken way of thinking and that we need to just be ourselves and do what um, we like to do best without worrying about what others think. Um, I personally really like this piece. I think it does a very, very good job of fulfilling the assignment that was given and being able to see structure and skin, but they also blend really well together. And I think that the person probably took a very long amount of time trying to put this together and that adds value to the piece and I really appreciate the piece because of that. All right excellent critique nicely done. Um, I really appreciate how you are specifically trying to address those steps in the critique that that, um, that really helps to formulate uh, or it helps us to appreciate the formulation of your thoughts. So thank you very much. Now, do you also have your own to do or is that the second and last one? I don't have my own today. OK, all right, excellent. OK, I'm going to continue on with the role. Has uh, Delane joined us? How about uh, Sage? Is she here? OK, uh, Hayden. Here. All right. Emily. I am here. Wonderful. Emery. How about Brindley? Is Cassidy here? Right here. Excellent. Kayana. How about Taylor? Is uh, Sage Sagers here? Is Michael's here? Yeah, I've been here. I think I was spaced out when you were calling roll before. Actually, I only went like four down and then we oh, okay. started with Alyssa, so. But if you want to feel bad about being spaced out, go ahead. All right. 
Uh, Karen. Here. Excellent. Keely. I'm here. All right. Is Evan here? Yeah, I'm here. How about Hillary? I'm here. Wonderful. The first code word is present. Of course, no irony intended, but plenty is there. There have, have um, excuse me, the morning class has already sent in two PowerPoints already, and both of those are up on our YouTube channel. Would you guys please over the weekend check those both of those out? I think both of them are pretty well done. One is about six minutes and one is about eight minutes. And what I appreciate about it is that both of them did a very short biography of the artist that they were looking at. But the, the biography when they spoke it was less than a minute and it was couched in terms that tied it directly to uh, what motivates their art and how they do their work. So one was on Dahosa and his work, his biography was specifically addressing uh, why he does what he does with his artwork. And so I, I think that that's a really good way of doing it. So you don't have to relate where the person went to high school, uh, what day of the week they were born or anything like that. Just enough about their life to highlight perhaps their motivations and uh, maybe to suggest some connection with why they do what they do. Now, um, going forward, we only have a couple weeks and please, and Tuesday and Thursday this next week, if you want to do your um, crit artistic critique in class or your presentations or whatever, let me know at the beginning and that's what we'll do. In class for the next two weeks, it's primarily will be me talking in the background while you guys are doing your work. All right, so come in and do your presentations and things like that. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, this last week. Who has had an opportunity, who has taken the opportunity to watch the research videos and learn a little bit more about these artists in module six? I have. I have too. All right, excellent. Which artist particularly struck you? Um, I think I mentioned yesterday in class that I really liked Judith Scott's work. Um, that's right. But also because of the commentary around her really intrigued me because I mean we talked yesterday about like what defines an artist and you know how she is an artist but her work like she doesn't consider herself an artist <laughs> which I think is kind of funny to me because she did make art so I just really liked her art because you know just because somebody has a disability doesn't mean that they can't create something of value I, you know, I, I think that's a really good point. And I think the word ability or disability is really overcharged with expectation. Uh, what we assume is that the standard is everybody's abled or similar, similarly abled at least. And when we say disabled, what that generally means is the person is not abled in the way that we take that uh, majority of other people take for granted. So I think that that's a really good perspective to have for this artist. Um, it addresses some really hot topics or hot points right now that are very emotionally charged. So yeah, thank you for that input. Um, who is the other person that saw the research stuff? That was me, Hillary. All right, uh, which artist particularly struck you? Um, one artist that struck me was Tony Cragg. I really liked the his ability to take something that is discarded and um, turn it into something beautiful. I like the way he uses color as well, just the sorting and the process of processing of gathering materials is really appealing to me. 
searching through rubbish, etc. I think I think that's really interesting because we talked about like on the quiz there was that other person that took rubbish and put it into plastic bags, so it became more of a conceptual participatory uh, work of art. I think that 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 kind of perspective is really interesting, and I appreciate you pointing that out. I think there's an awful lot to be said when we make our own things. Like um, I learned how to when I was doing uh, watercolor. I learned how to grind my own pigments and do things like that. I've learned how to make my own uh, traditional medicines, um, make my own paints for glass, different things like that. There is something to be said about making your own stuff. But I think it's also kind of remarkable when somebody can repurpose or upcycle stuff that everybody else has just completely ignored or discounted or thrown away. So I, I think that those, those are both really interesting um, artists that you guys focused on. This last week, the uh, participation exercise was basically taking three little artifacts, wrapping them, and then wrapping them together, and contemplating how that per process of cocooning changed the objects and your relationship to the objects. I would like to, to at least five people to just share a little bit about their experience doing that, um, talking about what kind of transformation did either they see or that happened within themselves at looking at these objects? Who would like to go first? I mean, hmm. The transformation of my objects was kind of boring. Uh, the transformation of myself, it was, I was full of hope and then I saw what I created and I was full of despair because it was really crappy. Um, yeah, that's what happened inside of me. Why do you think it was crappy? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I was definitely more focused on our conversation than, uh, than taking meticulous time to wrap things in a specific way. So it was, it was much more a stream of consciousness creation, which I think has some worth. Um, but I was, I was thinking about one thing and then just kind of keeping my hands busy with the other. Right. Um, and so it's, it's kind of ironic because we were talking about abstract art and is there value behind art without concept. And as we were doing that, I was making art without any concept. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. I, I think that that's kind of interesting. And I, I think that uh, part of me wants to argue that when you do something like that, the thing that you create, whether or not you like it when you're done, still has value because it's evidence of that whole process. You know, it's it's a waypoint to that process. And maybe um, it's a probably a good idea not to keep and treasure it always, but <laughs> uh, examining it and keeping it in your memory uh, I think can really help in the future. So I, I think that's 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 a good observation. Thank you. Who would like to go next? This brings us to the second code word. The second code word for today is silence. All right. I'll, uh, I'll share some thoughts. Please do. So it was very interesting to take these objects that I was very familiar with. Very, like I, I'd known what they were and experienced them in a, many different ways. And it was interesting to take them, put them together, and create this almost foreign alien-like object from them. It was like creating a new experience, taking something that you know so well and turning it into something you have no idea about, it kind of created this feeling of anxiety as I was taking these objects that I knew and made them into something I didn't quite like. Well, I, I, th I really like what you're saying because, like Evan, you know, you, you feel on some level that maybe this wasn't successful. But I think that uh, being honest about it is a big part of what our creation is. And sometimes it can be incredibly uncomfortable. And I liked your observation about uh, taking things that are completely familiar and turning them into something alien. 
if you watch that first video uh, on the research uh, part for module six, you'll see all these different artists that work with basically plastic garbage. And there's one artist that makes things that remind me, that make me think of uh, what you're saying. They will take a computer digitizing program, scan garbage into it, and then use the program to help them decide where to cut it and manipulate it. So they'll make this table, for example, that is made of all the fused bodies of these uh, rubber duck um, bicycle toys. And it just, you see these uh, just randomly inserted rubber duck heads supporting this table. And it is, on one level, it's really kind of cool. On a, a really big level, it's incredibly disturbing and just a little nauseating. <laughs> but I think that's a really good observation. Sometimes when we're being honest, it can make us very uncomfortable. Uh, who would like to go next? I can go. Okay, please do. So when I went into it, I kind of didn't expect much. But after I was done, I was like, oh, this is actually pretty cool. And I, I'm thinking of keeping mine as a fidget toy. So it, it changed my perspective on what it could do. Like what I could turn out of it, make three random objects into something that I can actually do something with. What were the objects that you started with? I had a plastic dinosaur, a Easter egg, one of those ones that you can pop open, and a, like an oyster shell. That's a that, I fuzzy string. You use fuzzy string? Yep. How distorted was the thing you were done compared to the things you started out with? Could you recognize much of anything? I can, like I can, I can find the head of the dinosaur and the the egg stand out, but like I don't know how recognizable. How if you could like go into it looking at it, you'd say, "Oh, this is what these are," especially the shell. Yeah, that that's really kind of cool, and I. One thing that I like about this process is that it really helps us just as we watched a, a video about artistic critique and those people were talking about the Henry Moore sculpture. As they continued talking, they saw more and more of the sculpture. And I think one thing that you're highlighting a little bit is this process, as you're working on hiding the thing, you become more and more aware of the thing, not necessarily as it was before you started, but just as a physical object. So I, th I think that's really interesting. Who would like to go next? I can go. Um, I thought it was interesting as I was wrapping mine that it kind of felt like wrapping presents. And I realized that we kind of do this all the time, that we wrap objects to make it unknown to whoever we're giving it to, to make it more exciting for when you actually uncover what it is. So I kind of liked, you know, bringing my objects home and then having my husband guess what it was, you know, made it more kind of a fun um, experience to try to wonder what something was underneath the wrapping. I think that that's a, that's a really, interesting thing because you're uh, actively engaging the viewer and uh, you're playing with that idea of the monkey mind that we talked about uh who wrote the book uh, hero with a thousand faces joseph See? campbell campbell because i was thinking of as as uh, i think it was keely was talking i was thinking of that book as well as manly palmer hall's uh perennial uh, wisdom. Uh, he wrote a book called Perennial Wisdom. What uh, Joseph Campbell did was articulate that idea that the the concept of hero is wrapped in so many different guises, in so many different cultures. And Manly Palmer Hall took the idea that the concept of faith or religion or spirituality is also wrapped in thousands of different guises throughout all sorts of different cultures. And this is something that I, I think Keely is absolutely right. We do all the time. Maybe not necessarily to objects, but specifically to our own selves. 
uh, very much so. I mean, all of us have parts of ourselves that we wish we didn't or we wish were different. And all of us present ourselves differently wearing masks like Joseph Campbell talked about um, to different audiences. We generate different stories. We kind of cloak ourselves with different personalities depending on who we're talking to. If anybody doubts that, just observe yourself how different you are when you walk among a group of friends and when you have to go to a dinner par uh, with your extended family. You know, you, we're very different people in those two settings. All right, we need one more person. Who would like to go next? Well, I was going to ask you, Michael, uh, is your shop, is it right uh, just a couple doors south of the men's haberdashery on University Avenue? Or is it in another building? Um, I'm not sure. The I don't think so. I, it might be a bit north of there. All right, because that that building with the men's haberdashery. I was I thought that your shop was um, just a little bit south of it, but I'm th it must be a different block. One one thing about that is I have some stories about uh, hauntings in several of those buildings there that I'll have to tell you about, especially the little kid that doesn't have a head that runs around shouting at people, which is kind of interesting because if he doesn't have a head, how loud can his shouting be? You know, anyway, who would like to go fifth? Um, I'll go. Please do. Um, my experience was. Well, I chose, uh, I didn't maybe realize the assignment was to combine, so I chose an item to wrap, and I was hoping as I kept wrapping it, it would look better, um, but it, I don't think that happened. But um, <laughs> it was interesting to try to change the form of it. Um, when only having one item, it was hard to change the form of it that way. So I had to like kind of tie, like I was tying it with um, mylar balloon strips. And so I had to kind of like tie loose strips and then um, like tie them together to try to create some other form that wasn't the thing itself. So it was a bit tricky. I That's thought that the, the transformation, even with the mylar that you were using, I thought the transformation just to the one object was really kind of interesting. Could could you talk a little bit about how the reflection kind of altered it? Yeah, I think that's that's probably what made it the most interesting is that by cutting it into the strips and tying it into knots, um, there like the inside of the mylar is that silver reflective surface, so it kind of reflected on that, um, like the outside of the balloon. Um, it was reflecting the outside of the balloon, so it kind of added some movement and more. Um, depth maybe okay i'm sorry could you remind me again what your original object was it was a lighter that's right the the different things that we use to wrap stuff with i think can be really unusual too or i'm not i'm i'm sorry not unusual but the material can really have an effect on it. And I think that what's fascinating to me, what you were, I was watching as you were wrapping the lighter, and it was interesting to me that you were tying, tying the strips of the mylar around on it. The reflective material kind of changed the effect of the object, even though it may not have changed, in your view, the profile of the object very much. What was fascinating to me is that the little, the little loose ends with the, the flashing, the uh, mirror, gave interesting points or uh, different points of interest to look at that I thought was kind of interesting and really changed the solidity of the lighter in my mind. So I thought that was that was fascinating. Well, I yeah. Was, oh, I was just going to say I was kind of inspired by I can't remember the artist's name, but the woman who was doing like sea urchin type um, forms with pencil tips. Um, obviously, my materials were very different, but I was kind of trying to 
do a similar form where like the spikiness coming out of, of the center. Yeah, uh, Jennifer Meister. That's that's who I wanted to talk about next. Yeah, very, very good. Excellent. Um, is any are any of you guys doing Jennifer Meister as your uh, research artist? I'm doing her. Oh, you are? Yes, because I, I wanted to talk a little bit about her. Um, I'm going to share my screen really quick. If I can figure. Yes, here we go. All right, can everybody see this? Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Now, one thing that I really like about this work, uh, there was some concern about some of the objects that I showed in that slideshow over the week. Each class, somebody, at least one person said, but they're not wrapping anything. And in this case, she doesn't really appear to be wrapping anything other than just a volume, does she? She's making these forms, but I think that this counts as a cocoon because what she's doing is making something where she's concentrating almost entirely on the shape of that outer shell. You know, work, working with these pencils in this way, and those those pink dots almost look like um, lipsticks to me. I don't I don't know. So I, I think if you chose to make something that was wrapping an object that was imaginary, that would be totally valid too. I think we talked a little bit. Um, did both classes hear me talk about the uh, paper mache yarn balloons? I don't remember it. Okay, I was doing this as a, a project in one class where People took balloons, blew them up, taped them together, and then made paper mache, but dipped string in the paper mache or yarn. And when it was good and soaked, they would wrap the balloons kind of loosely in this stuff, kind of um, almost paint lines with the yarn across the surface of the balloons. And when the paper mache dried, you could pop the balloon and pull it out. So you're left with all these hollow forms that are rather lacy with this stiffened yarn everywhere. And uh, the object that it wrapped is no longer even there. They do make really interesting things. If you can imagine five or six balloons taped together, wrapped with this paper mache string so that they take on the form, and then you pop and remove the balloon, it looks almost like uh, bulbous houses for paramecium's or something like that. Very you can, odd. You can do the same thing with sugar water and it'll crystallize on the string oh that sounds really cool have yeah. you done that yeah i think that that would be that would be an excellent project to do especially if you did like a half dozen of them that would be incredibly cool and if you combine them together somehow i think that would look really neat but yeah i'm just going through some of jennifer meister's stuff just because I think they're absolutely fascinating. Do you guys know how she uh, puts these together? She actually takes these uh, little pencils and each of them are about an inch, inch and a half long. She will drill holes through the ends of them and she puts string through those and ties it together like that and she get makes these shapes that's uh not what i expected at all that's yeah it's, it's it's um an incredibly intense way of working and i i just think i think it's absolutely fascinating that she takes that kind of energy or expends that kind of energy Can I uh, say something a little bit interesting? Yeah. So as she's creating some of these projects, they're actually subject to change 
as she see how the forms interact with themselves and the space around them. So she doesn't start out with necessarily a concrete idea of what she's doing, or does she start out with an idea of what she wants to do and then allows it to kind of become its own thing? She starts out with an idea and then modifies it as she sees fit as she goes along, because sometimes, you know, you come up with a plan, it doesn't always work out correctly. Oh, that's never happened to anybody in the history of the world, has it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she actually started with nails instead of pencils, but she found that it was too hard to work with, so she moved to colored pencil tips. I think this is fascinating. And I, I really like that, she, that she's allowing the art or the medium to kind of have its own voice and participate in her personal conversation. Can you see on, on the right edge of this, with the base of all these blue pencils, you can kind of see where they come together, the little holes connecting them. Can anybody see that? On the right hand edge of this piece? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's where she drilled the holes so that she could sew them together. But this, I think this is just fascinating. And, and it's really kind of neat that to uh, learn that an artist is actively engaged in allowing her medium to uh, its own voice, too. I think these all look rather organic. They all look like they could very well be found while you're doing uh, scuba diving somewhere or snorkeling. But they do seem to me to be underwater objects. I was going to say they look like extraterrestrial plant life. Oh, yeah, they could have been in. Uh, well, what's that movie? Um, Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Yeah. I think that's absolutely incredible. Who of you want to dedicate this guy, this kind of level of time to producing something like this? This is just astounding. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to turn that off right now. I wanted to go back a little bit to Jean-Claude and Christo. Let's see. One of their works is going to be shown uh, later this year. And they, they had started it years and years and years ago. But um, it's the Arc de Triomphe uh, that they envisioned, uh, you know, what it would look like wrapped in plastic, where the knots would be, all that kind of a thing. And one thing that is fascinating to me, let's see. I'm sorry, I hit the wrong button there. One thing is absolutely fascinating to me is the level of work that these guys have plugged into designing how the wrapping happens. And I want to I want to show this a little bit. I'm going to share my screen again. Let's see. All right, here we go. Can you see this? This object I believe is a fuel can. I'm not entirely sure. I think that's what it is. And you can see in the exhibit space to the left of it, he uh, is standing in front, Christo is standing in front of this wrapped object. So it's not really big. But what's interesting to me is that when he designed this, he sketched the object out and then he sketched where all those ties would go and how wide of rope he would use, you know, the, the thickness where it would overlap, where that knot would be, the great big knot. I, I just think that that's really fascinating, where if you look at this, it just looks like something randomly wrapped. But he was very conscious of how the eye moved. Like on this, you have um, three different colors of rope or twine. You have kind of a red, a yellow, and a cream. But he does that specifically to kind of make it a lot more interesting than if it was just one strand, for example. And I think it's fascinating that he puts the knots exactly where he wants them to be. I don't know how he decided where those were, but I think it is really interesting. So it's deliberate. Like on this one, we see the, the left side seems to be really open and simple. And the right side 
is all wrinkled with lots and lots of activity. Here, I think, I'm not sure how I feel about this one. I, I love the mystery of that. This chair, can everybody see this chair? Yeah. I really like what's going on with uh, the cloth, you know, the stains and everything like that and the wrapping. I think the only thing that kind of bothers me about it is that you can see too much of the chair. I kind of enjoy the mystery. This one I really like. Because, you, of course, you can see the table, but there's no way of knowing what that package is. And, of course, you're involved because you really want to find out. But also, it's kind of fascinating just with the raw shape. I think this is kind of interesting where he's just wrapped a painting. I like the material because the material, when it overlaps, becomes a lot harder to see through. In some areas, you can see it very almost clearly. And then again, you have the twine with the knots in very specific locations. And I really like this one. Could I, could I get a couple um, people just to, or at least one person, just to say something about this one? Why is this one interesting? I like that the uh, string matches the background, that kind of orange that's on there. Yeah, it's fascinating because the lighter string matches the lighter background. The darker string kind of ties it into the the paint of the frame. That's really yeah. pretty cool. Anybody else want to say something about it? This kind of makes me think of uh, Betty Sarr's work where she found the garbage and she turned it into that Aunt Jemima piece where you're taking something that ordinarily would just be thrown away and by putting it in a frame like this, a really beautiful frame, you're kind of forcing people to want to start asking themselves, why is this important? What's the value? And I, I think that whether or not the object has any value, I think it's kind of fun to do that with your audience sometimes. Now this this piece on the right, I find a little bit disturbing. That heavy plastic kind of reminds me, makes me think of body bags. So I think that this is a, just a little bit, uh, I don't know, it doesn't quite make me feel nauseated, but it does make me feel very uncomfortable. And I think that's cool that an artist can do that with just a couple of shoes. <laughs> Here's a portrait of Jean-Claude that's wrapped. I think these are fascinating. This is really kind of interesting and a little bit sad. Uh, you know, a pram that's wrapped up with pink plastic. I would like somebody to react to this. What do you guys think about this one? OK, I just want to say that this reminds me quite a bit of the Trojan horse from, you know, history. And it's kind of funny. <laughs> well, I, I think I think you're right. I mean, every time we see an image like this, which is uh, a manipulated or presented horse of some kind, I think it does. It can't help but harken back to that. The Trojan horse. Definitely. Uh, have you guys heard about the the haunted doll in uh, Florida? I can't remember what his name is. It's like Roy or something. I'm remembering that because I find toys that are treated like this, antique toys, that look kind of bedraggled and used like this, always hold the level of um, spookiness uh, for me. And I, I think that this is kind of a, a clever play on that. I think it ties in with the Trojan horse. I think it ties in with antiques and our love-hate relationship with antiques. I think it addresses ideas of memory and connotation with our own childhoods. I think there's a lot going on here. And all it is is a toy horse wrapped in a sheet and tied with rope. I think that's fascinating. 
do you think I'm reading too much into this or do you or does anybody other than Emily kind of uh, have some of the same kind of thoughts when they see this? What do you guys think? It makes me think of like a child's toy that was maybe like beat up a little bit too much by the child and it's like wrapped together so that it can just stand up. So there could be some um, symbolism there. I don't know yet. I, I think I think there's a lot to that. Yeah, it feels like it's being almost held together and supported only by the wrapping, kind of. It's been hard used. Do you think this is something that is worth looking at more? Uh, we're we're not. I'm not saying we're going to stare at it for the rest of the semester, but is it intriguing enough that it's it's worth subsequent visits? Apparently to somebody. <laughs> yep, I think so. I, it's one of those things where it's unusual enough that you could completely dismiss it or you could go back and visit it over and over again. I think this is that uh, heavy plastic really kind of bothers me. And I, I think it's interesting you wrapping a telephone like that. This is something that's interesting. I wanted to show you. This on the left is a sketch that he had done to prepare to do this thing. And it's fascinating to me how how different it is. You know, it's a different style chair, but he kind of worked out in the drawing where he wanted the rope, and when he did the actual chair, it changed quite a bit. There's another one where he did a car where you see the drawing of the car and the ropes are almost exactly where he wrote them, uh, drew them. Yeah, th something like this, I'm not really happy with it because if it seems to me like he got started on it and then kind of got bored, but I do like the others. <laughs> All right, so these are these are some really good ideas to think about as you're doing your own cocoon project. Uh, um, have we had anybody new join us in the last couple minutes? All right, the third code word for today is um, asparagus. All right, do you guys have any last questions before we part until next week? If you guys, if anybody finishes PowerPoints over the weekend, Please uh, send them to me and I will get them up on YouTube right away. And of course, uh, if you do them, uh, the first few people that do them will get extra credit points. So uh, please go feel free to do that. I think the first three people in, in the evening section and the first three people in the morning section will get extra credit points. So and please check them out, view them and see what you think. All righty. Nobody has any more questions. I will. Uh, say, I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend. Thank you. We'll see you guys. Okay.